what we need to do is we just need to run a metronome through the whole episode. So it's just like. Yeah. Then you can just sync that up. Yeah, that won't be annoying at all either. Oh, no. I see steam whistle. That is a steam whistle. Yeah, we had a uh, um, an invitation to a cottage on the weekend, so I went. I haven't. Ooh. Yeah, I I realized. Uh, yeah, I mean, don't don't think it's too fancy. The the washroom literally when I showed up, you know, you get the little spiel about this is how things work and this is what it is. Like, you know, there's some bedrooms in there. You know, you'll be sleeping out here on the on the deck, which is fine because I sleep in a hammock, and it was it was perfectly acceptable the washroom is anywhere you want and if you need to take a dump there's an outhouse over the hill <laughs> so that's the kind of cottage it was it was very nice like it was an excellent mm. setting um but I, I realized as i was buying beer to go to this thing um i haven't been into the beer store since 2016 give or take right and i was like what what kind of beer do i like like i don't know um steam whistle i guess right and at this point like i have that that sort of oh okay i'm in a store there's a lineup behind me because of course it's like a friday afternoon there's a lineup behind me of people who are like man uh, i'm starting to see things i need my beer and i'm like okay so i have this level of anxiety about what kind of beer am i gonna buy and then i'm like oh okay i've made a decision steam whistle and then he's like, do you want it in bottles or cans or tall boys? And now I'm like, now I have another decision to make. Oh, my God. Right. All this happened in probably like three seconds, but it felt like a century. Uh, anyway, <laughs> the point of the story is I got a dozen tall boys and it was 50 bucks. Um, and I drank eight of them on Friday night. Good for you which is like 12 beer. And you know what? Like, I mean, I woke up the next day with a hangover, but it wasn't as terrible as I would have expected. Yeah. So I went shopping too, since we last recorded and I've got some weird stuff. Oh, good. What do you got? Uh, I have blue lobster. Uh, it's a lemon lime vodka soda. Does it have lobster juice in it? I don't know. Maybe hmm. I'll let you know. Only crab lock and crab juice. I don't think so. No? No lobster juice? Oh, I mean, I'll if it's it. there, it's very subtle. Well, I mean, I'd have to read the list of ingredients, because if there is some, I'd take one sip and keel over dead. So what did you do up at the cottage? Uh, well, let's see. We sat around, and, uh, and we drank. Um, and then we had a campfire, and we drank. Uh, and then we got up and had breakfast. <laughs> and drank yeah uh, no i stopped drinking at that point because it was basically just an overnight you know like the our host more or less said hey you know you can go home whenever you want but i told my wife everyone would be out by noon because she's coming up so and that was fun i mean we got up we had like a, a casual relaxed breakfast and we just you know hung out and shot the shit for a bit it's been a while since i've been to a social outing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Tanya and I used to go to uh, a friend's cottage. They had their family had a cottage on a lake up near um, Bon Echo area, mm -hmm. and um, it was was really nice. Like, it's always the hey, this is somebody else's cottage, and and yeah. that has a whole vibe to it. But it was nice to be on the water. We really haven't had anything like that since. Um, she had a bit of a falling out with these friends and. You know, it is what it is. So it's been some years, but I always enjoyed it. Yeah, it's nice. This And that's a, a similar situation here is it's like, you know, like I, I can't afford to buy this cottage. Like that neighbor over there, his house cost a million and a half dollars. And that neighbor over there, his his cottage cost two million dollars. Like this cottage has been in my family for like four generations now. Um, and it's, a, it's kind of a glorified shack. Like it's very nice. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, cause I did actually mention at this gathering that I have a podcast and people may be listening. So I, I want to make sure that I, uh, um, that I give the right impression. Like it was, it was very nice, but it is like, it, you can tell it very much started off as 
like this is this is four walls and a bed. Mm-hmm. This is a place where we come up to the lake to go fishing, and this is where we sleep. Um, hey. It's neat and tidy. It's nice, but it's very small. I'm I'm in the looking at the housing market, buying houses, and I'm like legit having the conversation with myself. Okay, look, these cottages aren't like year round co- cottages. They don't they don't actually have like proper you know septic systems or anything. They're just holding tanks, and it's like, I mean, what would it take to live in one of those year round? Because in some in some places they're significantly more affordable than housing. Yeah. Yeah, there's there are some challenges to that. I actually oh, uh, for yeah, yeah. for part of part of my youth growing up, actually, we did not have an indoor toilet. Uh, and I, it's still, I think, a little bit more common than people would believe, even in mm-hmm. North America. It's and it's possible. It's I've been having thoughts lately that it might actually be more sanitary to do your pooping outside. I'm not Possibly. sure how much more. Probably it's I, I don't think that it's a major issue. Like I'm not I'm not suggesting that we take the bathroom out of our house and, you know, build a, a shack in the back backyard. With I'm not sure your wife would appreciate that. Oh no, I wouldn't have a wife anymore. I would suddenly yeah. be single. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh we finally have a house with more than one wife, bathroom. Yeah. 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 Well, are we gonna get right into it? Sure. I used to be an adventurer like you. Stay a while and listen. Well, it's been more than a week since we last talked, and um, we didn't really talk about Baldur's Gate 3 a hell of a lot in our last episode. But we are a Baldur's Gate 3 podcast now. <laughs> For maybe two more weeks, Max. Are, are you are you still working through your first playthrough? No, no, I finished no, it on the weekend. Did you? Okay, yeah, I finally got out of. I I finally left like the first starting area. Um, I did the um mountain pass thingy with the the get Yankee camp. So mild spoilers. I, I'm not going to give away any plot points or anything. I think everybody knows the general arc of the game. If you've played for more, most people who are playing the game have probably gotten farther than I have. Uh, yes. But I finally got past the thing. I basically wiped out all of the Githyanki because that was just fun. Um, strangely enough, Lazel doesn't seem to mind. Uh, that, that I think that's just Githyanki culture. Uh, and I went up the elevator from the Underdark to get to the the harper people and i met jahira <clears throat> which was was kind of cool and i have karlak in my party and she she had a little fangirl moment where it's like oh my god it's jahira it's the jahira um karlak is so great she is I have she's by far my favorite character i think a lot of the companions like i warmed up on them i was i was pretty meh on a couple of them and I, I have to say, without spoiling anything, their companion stories for a couple of them are so incredibly strong. Yeah. Like Shadowheart, um, I was just mad on her as a character, the writing of her character. Like, I accidentally got involved in a romance with her. Uh, completely you can break unintentionally. That off, by the way. Oh, I, I can, but that, that would be a dick move, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do another playthrough. I guess we'll just go along with this. But. You explore now. I imagine most of the back like character stories can go in like two or three different directions. I would expect, um, and they're going to share some similarities. But the direction that I went, um, yeah, you know, if there's a light side, dark side kind of thing for her, I ended up going light side with her. And I can't do evil. I can't. I want to so bad, but I yeah. can't. And it all led to like a sort of a climactic gut punch situation and like the quality of acting and writing in that moment completely redeemed everything that I was just kind of finding mediocre up until that point. Like it was, it was, I think I enjoyed that better than I enjoyed like the actual climax to the, to the main quest line. I one of the things that meeting Jahira brought up for me, I do actually want to come back to uh, a topic that really honestly should 
feature more prominently in our recordings, and that is sex. <laughs> not, just, not, not just because two dudes, two dudes yeah, just, talking to each other. Just, just yeah, just two dudes talking about sex. Um, mostly because I was thinking. Do you remember Revenge of the Nerds? Right. And one of the popular girls finally has sex with a nerd. She's like, oh, my God, that was so great. Why was that so great? Because nerds think about sex all the time. I mean, you think about this. We're playing a video game and one of the major, major focuses in this game. And if you don't see it, it's like, I mean, they slap you in the face with it is sex. Right. Romance as well. But I mean, sex is there, too. Um, Forgot where I was going with this. I think it's an interesting point because it is one thing I will say about this game is that like, okay, it probably is not, you know, meant to exclude younger people. The rating, you know, young kids should not play this game. Let's nope. let's be very, very clear about that. Oops. If you're considering to let your young kids play and you know what, like, I don't, I don't have a problem with like young kids and boobs, but there's, there's, thematic tones and, and and things like that that are just very very adult and then there's the some way dark shit. the way relationships and 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 sex and things are explored in this game it's just a very adult sort of atypical portrayal of it for video games like even video games like mass effect and and stuff where like the the romance or the relationships between characters is a significant part of the game even if it's really like not very significant in terms of what's on the menu mm. you know it's 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 sort of one of the features that defines it right sometimes it's as simple as ooh, hot alien sex or whatever but it's always done in a very juvenile way like a yeah. sterile kind of like YA novel kind of and that's oh, it's all fine. behind the veil. Yeah, no, and it you is. Know? And it it's suitable for most video games. Like this one very obviously from the beginning uh gives you a, a different sort of view on things. One of the things I did want to mention is is that I think like of all, all of the voice acting in the game is is awesome. Mm -hmm. Um but I think that uh Carlax voice actor is just just absolutely bang on like among a cast of people who are doing a really great job she she sort of shines a, above that yeah. uh one of the odd things that i've noticed though is that the druid guy what's his name halson mm -hmm. um it, the voice actor is fine some of the recording quality is like why is that a different level yeah i noticed that with him i noticed it with I want to say Jihiro once. Um, There's a I don't know if they, yeah, if they had to do some like rewriting of some stuff and it was like uh, literally phoning it in. I, I have a feeling because I was watching something that somebody was doing some voice acting and especially during COVID, I imagine that a lot of them did it in sort of a sort of uh, bare bones kind of home studio situation. Mm -hmm. And they probably just got like position of the mic a little bit wrong or, you know, like changed the setting a little bit. But it was one of those things where it's like, man, like you could have done some post-production on this and like blended it at least. It might have still stuck out. But the 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 difference between literally it and everything surrounding it in terms of dialogue was a bit off-putting. Yeah, and it, it was might... like, did my like batteries die in my headset or you know <laughs> it, was, it did a little it felt a little bit like okay so the other thing was like recorded at lossless and this is recorded at 32 kbps or something right this is yeah this is this, a really compressed mp3 this, this was like stripped off of an answering machine and not like you know modern <laughs> digital voicemail like this is, this is one of those little mini little cassette tapes. tape kind of things yeah yeah um, I they, think they re recorded it by like holding the mic up to the answering machine speaker. And... <laughs> they, they hot dubbed it off the radio. <laughs> um, I have a feeling that they probably did do a little bit of post processing and that's the best they got. Yeah. That's my gut feeling. I, I so, mean, it's fine. It's, it's such a minor issue. It's one of those things. It's like, Oh, well that happened. Whatever. Move on. The story has been really great so far too. And you're barely into it. 
I am. I mean, I'm, I did respect. I, I went Paladin. I told you that. And I, I respect into, uh, into Fighter when I found a dagger. Well, it's a short sword, really. And I'm like, I really want to put this in my main hand. But if I put this in my main hand, a shield in the other hand makes this a little bit wimpy. And it doesn't fit Paladin. So I switched to Fighter, which is a little bit more... Um, in line with how I'm playing anyway. Like I'm not playing super goody two shoes, which is how I like to play Paladin. So I just, eh, I'll just respec, carry on. Yeah. I found uh, playing because I played Dex, right? So I was your your uh, battle master, Dex fighter, dual wielding rapiers. Um, with the 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 way the the pacing of the game and just how readily available rest is, like. In a in a, our campaign playing that character, it was like I have incredible burst for about three rounds, and then that's that's kind of it for me, right? Where like I could outpace a paladin in those three rounds, and then you know that pally just keeps wrecking, and my my suboptimal fighter would just become suboptimal. I just wrecked shit, man. Like even comparing myself to like Lazel, who was the the proper way to do a battle master fighter um just just destroy uh in terms of damage output yeah and it was good for me because i i, I didn't use um asterian in my party very much aside from like his I stuff don't, i don't and like asterian being dexy enough like i i didn't miss the rogue yep. you know i was able to, to do a little bit of the heavy lifting not as well uh asterian is actually another character sort of storyline that like while I still didn't use the character regularly and didn't align with sort of the initial direction of the character man what a what a sort of arc he went through like it was one of the highlights of the game going through I really shit. yeah I really kind of want like I like his introduction I mm -hmm. like his early character stuff and then he just becomes such a little shit it's like I don't want to associate, and I have a problem with with both him and Will, um, just mm -hmm. because I don't. I mean, personalities just don't don't gel. I'm not. Yeah, I don't. Know, I don't and that's fine. That's yeah, fine. That's totally fine. I they, mean, they I, I, offered a sort of diverse menu of characters, yes. so that you know, regardless of who you are, you can probably assemble a party of people that don't annoy you. Yeah, you and know, I really I'm working more around personalities than I am around skill sets which is great because that's how D, D is supposed to work yep um i do want to go back to the the combat though because i started off thinking wow like combat's a little tricky uh you know when you get to the sort of big set pieces the the incidental stuff is is pretty easy but the mm -hmm. uh the big set pieces i'm like oh okay it's a little bit challenging and now i'm i'm level seven which i don't know how that compares to what you're supposed to be for moving on to act two it seems like I'm probably a little bit overpowered for it. Probably am. Um, but like, I would expect the game to scale a little bit uh, for that, uh, and I, I don't think it is because I'm just like I'm just going through things like a wrecking ball. Mm. I'm not not really drinking potions. I'm not using scrolls. It's literally like punch, punch, firebolt. Are you playing on the the middle difficulty yeah. setting? Yeah. And I'm thinking, like, for my next playthrough, I think that I'm definitely moving up to Tactician. Because it, it's, I mean, I did I did a start at Tactician, and I got absolutely wrecked. Uh, you know, you, you first land on the, you know, wherever you land, uh, the mm -hmm. Nautiloid crashes. Uh, and then you meet those those mind, the brain thingies. Um, the heck are they called? Intellect of ours? That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, the intellect of ours. And there's, like, three of them. And they absolutely wrecked me. Like it was TPK in two turns. And like, the heck? Right? Like this is super easy on regular mode, and I'm like death immediately on hard mode. Yeah. So. Uh what I will say is a lot of the difficulty comes out of sort of environment. Yes. Um, and then when you start getting a little further into the game where you're dealing with, you know, bosses and mini bosses kind of stuff, there's uh there's elements of that that you have to figure out before you find the way to make those encounters easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. like 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 a game. 
yeah. um you know most of the, the the frustration will come from sort of environmental stuff and positioning and bad positioning and uh, so um, so much push uh oh i guess they're dead now yeah yeah i uh i myself i finished the game over the weekend and i'm not disappointed I was actually talking to Chris today about this. Yeah. Um, he's getting close to finishing the game. It's an amazing game. I, I found it absolutely amazing, but I ran into a few things that are partly my fault that have left just a, a bit of a sour tinge in my mouth as I wrap the game up. Um, the first thing is, is there were some bugs. Just a few. Uh, there's a few that, that led to just some confusion on my part. Uh, there was a romance bug, actually, with Shadowheart. Like, I never got to have my romance with her. I just, it, it's like it skipped over it. There's supposed to be, like, a beach scene or something that happens where you're swimming or something. I don't know. I didn't get to see it. It went from, we had, uh, had our, our drinks at that sort of little celebration at camp right after the the grove stuff where it's like oh i talked to her first and now everybody else is mad at me because apparently they wanted to hook up tonight and which is so weird i think it was a bug uh because they definitely had patch that addressed some of the the horniness the the over aggressive horniness and i don't know if maybe part of the problems i had was that I started the game before that patch and then continued playing through those parts of the game after the patch was deployed. But I didn't get that sort of romance scene with Shadowheart. And then after one long rest, she's talking to me as if we'd hooked up. Oh. Yeah. You know, okay. and, 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 um, you know, and conversations about our relationship now. And it's like, oh, okay. We're going to your parents for Christmas, right? <laughs> Mescaline, man, it's it's a hell of a drug. Uh, it's a hell of a drug. <laughs> well, I, I I sort of talked to Carlock first, and it was like, oh, this is this is super neat. And then you know she gives you the hall pass of, well, you know, like we can't do anything, so have fun with the others, but save a piece for me. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go and talk to. Yeah, because I in my first playthrough I got far enough that I hooked up with Lazel at that thing, which is very much a I want to have sex. Let's have sex. Okay, we had sex, and like, well, that was just a thing, right? Yeah. Whereas Shadowheart starts the whole well, you know, like we're gonna talk and we're gonna like braid each other's hair, and it's like, oh, okay. And then after a couple of days of that, I was like, man, I'm breaking this off. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, Right. Because really what I was what I was thinking was like, OK, like I'm involved with Carlac, but and this is so weird to talk about as a thing, like I'm romancing a video game character. As I'm saying these things, I'm literally thinking about, oh, my God, is my wife going to be jealous? <laughs> right. It's, Which is, it's interesting, though, because like it, those it, are the few parts of the game where like my moral compass is probably ooh. its strongest, though. Yeah. Right. Like there's the, you know, I accidentally got into a relationship with Shadowheart and it's like, well, I guess I'm doing this now. Cause like, and that's exactly what happened to me too, is because I thought like, okay, well I'll have fun tonight. And then, you know, yeah. like I'll, I'll come back. And it, like, I had like, literally it went as far as like a, an almost innocent little smooch after an evening of talking. And I'm like, feels wrong, man. Yeah. Can't do it. <laughs> so, um, another thing I ran into uh, in the game is that, uh, especially in Act 3, uh, Act 2, 3, I don't know, you get to Baldur's Gate. Okay. Once you get there, there's some things that clearly need to be done in a certain order to, to find the sort of optimal path. Some quests that depend on stuff from other quests. And I clearly did them in the wrong order, and there wasn't, like, feedback with the quest system saying this quest, you know, left some quests open as if I should have been able to do something. And I clearly couldn't do the things like there'd even be map, like objective markers on the map. And it's like, yeah. I, I can't do this. Um, yeah. And that, that sort of tied into. Okay. Minor, minor spoilers here. I'm going to try not to spoil it for you. Definitely. 
minor spoilers for the audience. I made the mistake of accidentally getting down a rabbit hole and reading some stuff that I shouldn't. It involved the character storylines for Will and the character storylines for Carlac. And in sort of understanding what different directions they could take, I was like, oh, okay. I'm going to actually try for these outcomes. Uh, okay. And I couldn't get them in my game. Not because I made decisions that, that, well, I guess I made decisions, but not that I made conscious decisions that I thought would directly affect those outcomes. Um, so with Will, for instance, he has a choice to make at the end of it. Uh, and it involves the... Potentially saving a family member. Okay. And the way things sort of pan out, he's, he's got to make it a sort of either self-sacrifice or, you know what, this family member's been a bit of a dick and, and I don't need to do this. I deserve my freedom kind of choice. And unfortunately, in, in reading a little bit about like the potential options for him, I learned, well, you can actually have your cake and eat it too. You can... Oh make the choice that is in Will's best interest and also rescue his father. Okay. So I'm like, I'm going to do that. And because I'd done another quest first, rescuing his father was not an option. So I had to deal with, you know, the consequences of him letting his family member, okay, I said father, so I spoiled it, die. And that was that. Well, I mean, we know that we're like, you literally know at the very or very close to the beginning of the game that you're going to be trying to rescue his father. Yeah. And that it is his father. Yeah. So, so. it isn't, isn't a, it's not a major spoiler, but it is a spoiler. Um, and the other thing is with Carlac, again, you know, she's quite literally got a ticking time bomb in her chest. And there's not a lot of, ways to resolve that in a satisfying manner. Oh, no. Um, in in the, the climax of the game, there's a decision that gets forced upon your character. And at least with me, I, I chose to um, uh, side with uh, Orpheus instead of Emperor. That'll mean something to you later. Um, yeah. I, I know the legend of Orpheus. Yeah, yeah. So my understanding, and again, it's my fault for ever letting myself read sort of spoilers and then putting some faith in them. My understanding was that instead of me making this sacrifice at the, the sort of end of the game that was required, and by sacrifice, I don't mean like sacrificing my life, just something else. Um, Carlac would volunteer to do it and it wouldn't be necessarily a happy, happy option, but it would be an option that would allow her to live and it would be something she chooses to do herself. And, you know, based on how things were going and, and what my understanding of like what she did and didn't want to do, that to me felt like a, a pretty good compromise for the character. Mm hmm and it just it, it it never was an option for me i don't know if it's if i had to be pushy with her about other stuff first to kind of warm her up to an idea it's entirely um, possible that you need to yeah. be at a certain point in the approval rating too oh my approval is basically maxed out for for everybody so i there's a there's a couple of times uh during the game where things have come up that i want to hear but I've accidentally clicked on a conversation and it's like, you know, the, the, you know, Mr. Dream man or whatever is talking in my ear, but then I've started a conversation. And I only hear half of what he has to say. Mm -hmm. And that dialogue isn't actually recorded anywhere. And I found that frustrating. Yeah. My major frustration with the game, and I actually sent you a message about this, uh, is that I would like to be able to look up. I don't need to be able to look straight up. I don't need 360 degrees. But there's one point early in the game where someone says, oh, look at the dragon. What dragon? I can't see the dragon. Yep. 
there's a few points during the game where there's a problem that your character can see something that you as the player cannot see and they don't they don't leave it highlighted long enough for you to find it i mean these are not me and it's never anything like oh my god if you don't find that the game is over it's just oh i i didn't find an extra 12 gold whatever yeah it's just it's such a silly thing and i know i harped on this a lot during my like first few yep. rants about Baldur's gate 3 and it's related to the control scheme but also just the the decision to in trying to give you that faux isometric feel that seemed to honor the original game and second one. Even though you can push back down into what feels like a good third person view, not having a full mouse look there just feels silly. Yeah. And I know it's a, like it's a full 3D environment, like. I'm already looking at the sides of stuff, so I know it's not like I'm going to see unfinished work by looking up i can't see on top of things that i couldn't see on top of before i know that if i were to climb something high i'd probably see a lot of the things that i would see if i wanted to look up yes so you know and, and even if it was just up a little bit yeah or when something was happening even if they didn't give you the ability to do it on demand when something was happening if they would just script it so that oh i see something look at that and the camera moves up camera actually shows you what you're supposed to be looking at yeah i would be okay with the game almost like cutscene style taking control of the camera at that point yeah They're, they One did the... something similar later in the game where like things are happening around you in sort of a bigger battle and it doesn't allow you to look up but what it'll do is it'll take the camera from your point of view and just like move so that you can see this other thing that's happening then it'll snap back to you after that thing happens and that was an okay compromise. It just felt weird that that wasn't more consistently done through the game, especially early on. I think, yeah, especially early on. That's the, And one of the things, like in the, in the goblin camp, right, like there's, there's rafters. Like there's a, mm -hmm. one of the things they did really well was add like levels of verticalness yeah. uh, to some of the combat set pieces which is great. It's fine. It's fun. You can push people off of stuff. You can trip people and it actually matters. Um, it, it sort of makes maneuvering matter a little bit more. It makes uh, positioning matter a little bit more. Uh, oh, it, and it, it also adds challenge in that, like, you know, you've got yes. enemies up there too and, and you're they can vulnerable. push you into the abyss. Yeah, or even if they're just in the rafters and you're not, right? Like there's, yes. if but you're that, not equipped to deal with that situation... Everyone in my group. Challenge. Everyone in my group has good ranged capabilities. It, the problem is, is that it was like, how do I target them? I can't target them. I can't zoom out far enough to actually put them in the screen. You can just click on the initiative tracker for targeting, though, right? You can, but is that the one that's in the rafters? Maybe. I don't know. There's 73 you, people on my initiative tracker. Have you? Which one am I looking for? Have you been using tactical view, though? Yes, you still can't scroll out far enough to get into the rafters. Really? Yeah, it's scroll, 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 scroll. Not <laughs> quite. I can see like a vague hint that there's, you know, the, that there's that sort of dithering where you can see a thing, but you can't actually select it. Right? I literally had to take Gale and climb him into the rafters in order to fireball somebody. Was it because... You couldn't see them or because you didn't have line of sight of them like path no. interruption is an issue with no. spell casting I, right i i couldn't i couldn't get my mouse on them right you can get them through the initiative tracker mm -hmm. once you know which one it is but i had to climb somebody into the rafters so that i could see when i click on them in the initiative tracker yes it's that one so without casting a spell though like if you just click on them to select them through the initiative tracker does your camera not move up above them nope that's weird. Yeah. I mean, it's entirely possible that it was a little bit of a bug or that I was just yeah, it might have been at that point. But I mean, it was a mook, so I wasn't really concerned about it. I literally was like, you know what? Gail's almost dead. I'll just climb him up in the rafters and fireball the guy into oblivion. I needed to get him out of melee anyway. So it's, I, again, these are things that like I'm complaining about and it's really not a big deal. Yeah. 
So you um, had a proposal sort of related to this. I did. And it's a little bit of a weird one, but meeting Jahira and hearing sort of the story of the original Baldur's Gate one, which I never finished, I was wondering if it made sense for us to do like the original Baldur's Gate in small chunks. Uh, sort of schedule it where we go, okay, like we'll we'll play through the game until we get to like for example the the inn. I forget what the the inn is called in Baldur's Gate one, but it's the very first place that you go to. Mm-hmm. Right. Literally um Gorion, your your guy. I found all of a whole bunch of um uh correspondence between various people in Gorion as well leading up to the the events that happened in Baldur's Gate one, which is kind of cool. Um but like you know the the end of the prancing pony or whatever the heck it's called like if we mm-hmm. say okay for next week we're gonna you know go from there to here and then we're going to talk about what happened and what we did and how things were different um and then the following week we'll say okay well let's let's go to this place and do this because i know i'm sure that the game itself has been mapped out pretty well um i don't think that we can play it multiplayer that would be fun uh, no, although I would be interested even just like only having one of us playing and the other one just sort of like watching and engaging, like I'd be happy to let you play. Sure. And that'd be cool. You know, me just like, w- you can do a discord share even, and, uh, we can kind of cap that or, or figure that out just to do a playthrough and, and like talk about the game as, as we're playing it. That's something yeah. that, you, you know, I miss from my childhood actually is that sort of experience of like two people playing a single player game together and just like handing the controller off and stuff at certain yeah. times like oh i can't do this you do this or whatever so that'd be neat what i would suggest is that we wait a little while yeah uh oh, cyberpunk yeah. yeah cyberpunk 2.0 patch comes out tomorrow the expansion drops next week that's going to be my my priority i think i'm gonna hold off on starfield until after i do that but then i will be jumping right into starfield so it's Man. gonna be a bit yeah and that's fine it, it's also the kind of thing where like it's such an older interface and yeah you know what it's good it's gonna be follow one man it's gonna be like oh this is nope nope I, i've done. noped out, i've noped out of it a few times i think if 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 we're sort of talking about it as we play through I think that that'll make it palatable. Yeah. And um, in short, in short bursts, I'm thinking like, you know, like play for 45 minutes or an hour and then, okay, this is a good stopping point and carry on. I think I got like three hours maybe into my last playthrough. I got down into the mines with the um, kobolds. Yeah. Early on. And like right after that, I was just like, ah, this is, this is a slog. So I didn't even get to the good, like fun parts. I no. I've never been to the fun parts either. Yeah. I mean, I've gotten I've gotten to the carnival. I've gotten down into the mines. Uh, I've gotten a little bit north of that, and that's no. It. I did I did play Baldur's Gate one and two originally back in the day, but so yep. long ago that I barely remember the storylines. Just enough to be like, Jahira, oh. Minsk, go. Oh, it's great. I remember yeah. them. You know, member berries. Uh, some very very basic kind of plot things like i remember oh yeah there was vampires and it was like you had to pick a side you're vampires or you know somebody else in the game and factioning and stuff was that two anyway doesn't matter probably yeah, two. i think i think it'd be fun we'll uh you know i don't mind being in the sidecar on that one and uh just sort of enjoying I, the experience together that might be might be interesting i i think that'd be fun and i think uh because i'm st- i mean i'm still like probably two weeks out from finishing uh, Baldur's Gate three, and I do actually want to get through it. Uh, but yeah, I think that would be that'd be a fun thing to do. At the and pace next you're play- playing, you're probably more than two weeks out. Well, I, I I'm stuck. I'm with one character now. I'm I'm pacing my way through it. I'm actually I'm actually to the point now where I'm I'm chewing new ground. And I think probably what I'm going to do because up until now I've been, you know, I need to explore every square inch of this map. I need to you know loot every chest and every vase but i have ten thousand gold now i think i'm probably good um i have a couple of uh epic and legendary weapons i'm I'm looking at gear and going i mean there's there's nothing here that's even useful so i think i'm probably gonna beeline the story a little bit and not worry so much about finding all the loots 
Yeah, my second playthrough, I'm going to sort of make a conscious effort to explore the side stuff a little bit more because I definitely missed a lot. Even, you know, I've mentioned like there's there's an entire game that can be played just to speak with animals, right? And I didn't get any of that. Um, I, yes. I caught most of the major side stuff, but like once you get into um, Baldur's Gate itself, like, you know, there's, there's a bunch of little side stuff that you can do that I got to the point where it's just like, okay, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm literally like doing loose ends before continuing with like the point of no return kind of, kind of situations. Yep. So, yeah. I, I do, I, there's, there was, uh, there's a, a few member berries for Baldur's Gate one and two that are subtle enough that like some people, obviously like a lot of, a lot of people are going to miss them because they just didn't either just didn't play it or, or it's been so long, but you know, like there's a couple of times where it's like, I almost can hear you must gather your party before venturing forth. And I'm so glad it doesn't do that anymore. Oh my God. That was frustrating. Yeah, I think they they struck the right balance with how they handled the member berries. Like yes. some of it, some of the more obvious stuff was actually kind of tongue in cheek, like in your your dialogue with Jahira, for instance. Right. Like, you know, because there's some some parallels in, in some of the stuff that happens in the middle and, and late part of the game uh, that parallel some of the stuff that happened during the the first couple of games and it's like okay well they handled it well by you know calling attention to the fact that yeah this is similar but it's not similar and yeah you know that uh, that uh, made it uh, made it interesting dialogue like did you did you kill and loot all of the gith in the crash um or did you make peace with them and carry on no, I want to say I ended up mowing through them. Um, one of one of not the all major... of them. No, I, you do you do something in there, and then you have the like everybody starts attacking you, and you could literally go back through all the wings in there and mow everybody down. I did. And I did. I did. I just made my way back through the exit, mowed everybody I had to go through to get out, and was like, ah, that's that's enough. Wait, you didn't go out the back door? There's there's like a whole secret thing in there. Anyway, um, one of the major foodstuffs that they're carrying is roasted space hamster. <laughs> Which, every time I see it, I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> Minsk is going to be pissed. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, Minsk and Boo is fun. Like, his... At least through my playthrough, his character story was reversed. Like, getting him is his character story, really. Like, I really didn't find anything to do with him after I had him in my party, aside from some, you know, very obvious Matt Mercer dialogue afterwards. Um, in fact, I never actually had him join my party. And when I finished the game, like you join my party, join my camp, but I never brought him into my active party. So he was mm -hmm. still level one. I, I had, I have a problem and I, I'd like your, your input on this is I, my party right now is, is me and I'm an Eldritch Knight. Uh, I have shadow heart. Um, I have Carlac and I have Gale. Mm-hmm. And the only one that I can see, like, the idea of replacing is Gale. Like, how do you replace Shadowheart? She's more or less integral to the whole story. Like, um, can, can, she, can you leave she her isn't, in camp? Uh, she isn't, but, you know, what I would say is that, like, there's times when you're going to want to have a cleric with you, you know? and For sure. You know? And she's the cleric. So uh, your party is very similar to mine. Like, that's actually the party that I wanted to run. And I found myself subbing Gale out for Will. Okay. I just can't stand listening to Will talk. I just yeah, can't. he's fine. You know what? I actually, his, his, his direct dialogue, I, I was annoyed with. But when you, like, walk around places with him in your party, the exchanges that he has with some of the other characters are actually quite fun. Yeah. 
Um, they do the Dragon Age thing very well of as you're walking around, your your party members are talking to each other. And yeah, um, man, there was one part where he, <laughs> it was rare that I had him and Lazelle in my party at the same time. Oh, they are fun though. And, but when you put them together, and they're there, she goes on talking about like her her interest in the carnal pleasures, and it's just like what? <laughs> <laughs> One point, you know, uh, Will's very interested, and then you you see the interest almost like, oh <laughs> no, maybe <laughs> maybe I've 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 bitten off more than I can chew here. <laughs> you have. Because I had a romantic interlude with Lazelle, and let me tell you something: she is not <laughs> submissive <laughs> at all. Uh, uh, <sighs> but anyway, I, mechanically speaking, like he did everything I needed Gale to basically do. Um, Fireball, and having the the uh, Warlock perk on the Eldritch Blast so that it could do uh, pushbacks was just. Mm-hmm. Especially because I was running, like, there's there's a few sort of environmental things that to get through, you need to be able to do certain types of damage. Huh. And force damage is the sort of go-to. And playing marshals, and, like, you know, my guy was pokey-pokey, so, like, almost everything was resistant to piercing damage uh, environmentally, <laughs> and... You know, I'd have cart lack and it'd be resistant to slashing damage. And then, like, what is Shadow Heart going to do? You know? Uh, so having Point. Will there that could just Eldritch Blast, pew, 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 it was great. And, like, I actually found not, I found myself needing to do proper crowd control less with him in the party because you could split up his Eldritch Blast across multiple targets and sort of just move people certain distances and position around even if you weren't knocking them off of things uh, it made it easier for like hey if i push this person back then this person doesn't need to blow an action on a disengage and and they can reposition themselves and it just it became too much of an advantage over you know what did gail offer besides you know more spell slots uh, yeah but that goes back to what I was saying about my character, where rest comes across pretty easily. So unless it's a really, really long encounter, um, you know, getting short rest in and, and getting your, your warlock spell slots back, like it's just... So was, yeah. Yeah, like I, I didn't find that to be a big problem in my playthrough. And, and again, with my, my composition uh, of my party at the difficulty level I was playing at. And maybe if we were playing on Tactician, you know, I would feel a little bit differently. I probably would have respect Shadowheart. Uh, like, I left her in her, and it's trickster, trickster domain. I'll tell you what, respecting her into life is way, way easier. Um, um, I think... Talking to Chris, he actually went... Um, uh, shit, what's the elemental spec? Um... Drawing a blank on the, the, the name of the, the subclass for the cleric. I don't I, I played know. a one-shot character. Um, yeah. Um, whatever. The, I, the elemental think- one. Apparently puts out like a ton of damage. I would, uh, I would be interested in trying a playthrough on Tactician where everyone is a marshal of one kind or another. Respec uh, Shadowheart is a paladin instead of a cleric. Mm-hmm. And then everybody everybody goes sort of like melee heavy. Would be interesting. Tempest cleric. That's sorry, Tempest. <sighs> okay, yeah, the storm yeah. cleric. Yeah, yeah. Um, it would be it would well. The other thing is is that like on second playthrough, I kind of want to uh, go with uh, Lazel and Asterian and Will, uh, just to see sort of like the other other side of it. Mm-hmm. This is this is one of those things that I talk about when when we talk about like game design and what makes a good game is that like you have many options but you're forced to make a choice right mm-hmm. like you can't uh, one of the problems I had switching from EverQuest for example and EverQuest had the same problem eventually but to WoW was like in WoW you basically put all of your abilities on buttons 
like you have access to all of it at the same time uh and like diablo 2 for example did this really well where like here's this entire skill tree that you've got pick two Mm. right and i think that that's that's a little too much right but i think diablo 3 actually did it sort of the the ideal thing where you've got you know like you've got two and then pick four additional ones yeah and that i like i wanted to like guild wars too i hated yeah. it Me too. and it's probably the same reason that i never got into like uh dota and league of legends and stuff like that is just having that that very limited collection of abilities like i like you know Hell, man, I like I liked back in the old school days of WoW, where not only were you choosing one of sixteen different abilities and spells to use, but you were trying to choose when to downrank them, right, for like mana yeah. efficiency and stuff. Yeah. I miss being a holy paladin during the the days of Burning Crusade, like uh, healing through uh, Black Temple, and like I'd have, you know, ten slots uh, of a bar just dedicated to flash of light of like all the various ranks so that i could just you know mash whatever ones i needed to keep the throughput up while being most efficient with my mana so going to something like guild wars 2 where you it's like oh i got like what, four abilities on my bar and that's what i get to use no nah, fuck that different strokes for different folks i i enjoy the idea of having many options but not all of them being on the table at once Speaking of different strokes for different folks and not everything on the table at once, hey, do you want to get into some table talk? I'm not sure that we have time for that table talk tonight. We have time. We can try it. All right, this this, this topic was your idea, so I'm going to let you kick it off. Oh, my God. All right, so this topic has come up on the D&D subreddit a bunch recently. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about it anymore, but I, I want to talk about fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and it definitely got a lot of bad press and a lot of heat and a lot of hate when it first came out. And I, I did actually play fourth edition for a good long while. Um, and looking back on it, I didn't hate it. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit, here's, here's my take on it. And then I want to know what you think. I, if, to me, it feels an awful lot like the new Star Trek movies where they're good movies. I enjoyed them a lot, but they're not Star Trek. Mm -hmm. And that's what fourth edition is to me. It's a good game. It's fun. It's balanced. um, It's very tactical. uh, Plan on spending a bunch of time and keeping track of a bunch of stuff. But it's not really Dungeons and Dragons. No, that's a summary. We're done. Topic over. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. All right. So for some context, I have to say, I haven't played fourth edition in forever like i i don't think i've even looked at it really since 2011 and oh, wow. i was watching some actual plays and and listening to some some pods back in the day that were using it uh but i probably haven't listened to those since what 2013 when some of them switched to like the play test versions of fifth edition so it's been a hot minute and to be fair I didn't play fourth edition a lot. So some of what I'm going to say is probably going to be ill-informed or like I'm, I'm picking nits that weren't a significant part of the overall design philosophy of the game. And Hey, it's just my opinions. You, you, you know, you all have a right to your own opinions. You're more than welcome to disagree with me. Uh, you're wrong. But that's okay. You you have the right to be wrong. <laughs> Welcome to the controversial portion of the show. Yeah. So I think just to get this off in, in a good sort of positive uh, start, there's some things I actually really liked about 4th edition. They did some things really well. Um, some mechanical things that I've started to work into some of my games. Um either verbatim or, or like an homage to, to some of these mechanics. Uh, the one thing I really liked was minions. One hit point minions. You know, they die on any attack, uh, survive if they make a save on any of area effect. Uh, was a great way to 
to represent, you know, just schlubby minion type characters. And it forced, forced players to make decisions, you know, things like, Hey, when am I going to use this big area of effect? Do I want it to mow down a bunch of one hit point things that if I ignore them are still going to put me in a world of hurt. I thought that was interesting. You know, it's, it's, it's an excellent, excellent mechanic. Mm -hmm. The other thing I liked, uh, I'm going to say the bloodied condition, but I think this speaks more to how stat blocks and things were done philosophically in fourth edition that like when creatures got below half HP, they got new abilities, right. And it allowed Mm -hmm. for the, the combat to, to shift and feel a little bit more dynamic. And I thought that was, in general, a good thing. It was part of something that was way too complicated. It was just one more thing to keep track of. But that particular piece of it, I liked. You know, it allowed uh, allowed for you to create a sense of desperation in, in things. And, and I try to, to emulate that a little bit without explicitly having a bloodied condition where I will throw stronger and stronger things out, even if I'm, like operating outside the bounds of whatever that monster stat block is Mm -hmm. i'll i'll do it just for the lulls because hey they're 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 on the ropes while the outcome maybe isn't a hundred percent determined at this point combat is trending in a certain direction let's shake it up and make it a little bit more interesting um now Positivity kind of put aside. There's two things that really, for me, were were weak points without getting into the obvious stuff like pacing of combat and whatnot. Um, fourth edition really is the only edition of D&D that, to me, was designed first and foremost to be a game. Yes. Not a role-playing game, a, a game, game that allowed for a little role-playing. Yes. It played like a board game or like a card trading game almost. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the, the rules were very, very mechanics-focused, and it, it it is a good addition of D&D if you want 85 or 90% of your D&D to be combat. And you want to have that sort of crunchy, munchkin tactical uh, experience where, you know, fighting some kobolds takes four hours. It doesn't need to, but it, it well, there was a lot of things but to keep track of. The game certainly, yeah. it doesn't need to, but that is the DM recognizing that the game is pushing encounters to this sort of tactical level level and the the dm dialing it back um and that of course leads to slow pacing just you know the amount of shit that you're trying to do numbers you're trying to keep track of bonuses here bonuses here wait like it it was i remember in the, the the games that i did play like there was so much arguing oh we forgot oh we forgot exactly oh wait we didn't go back and apply that bonus on my last turn and can we go back and recalculate that and do the math and it's ah this this is an excellent place to bring up the idea because we've been we've been kicking around the idea of of our own role-playing sort of systems mechanics things Mm -hmm. one of the things that has popped into my head as i'm as i went down a rabbit hole of like calculating uh statistics and it's breaking my brain and that's fine Mm -hmm. uh probabilities are are complicated but one of the things that i want to hold in the forefront of my brain when i'm thinking about mechanics and systems is i don't want people doing math Mm -hmm. right fourth edition to me because uh like original advanced dungeons and dragons and then second edition dungeons and dragons and then even third and 3.5 the probabilities were janky and things weren't balanced, but it was kind of like that on purpose to make mm-hmm. people work together as a team. Um, 
probably not ideally done. Fourth edition was very balanced, but it, like there was a lot of math. It's like, okay, I get plus two from this, but minus one from that, and plus three to this, and minus one from that, and, and I get plus five from that, and minus seven from that. Now, what does that add up to? What was the first one again? Oh, wait, who am I standing beside? Okay, I get another plus four from this. And, yeah. And, and five people in a seven-foot radius around me also get it, but only for one turn, uh, and that only lasts to the end of my next turn. But this one lasts two turns, and this one I get like once per encounter. Uh, and this, oh, I'm going to throw out my daily now, and suddenly everything changes again, and you have to recalculate. Like every time someone does something, you have to recalculate everybody. Yeah. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, po- that's perfectly fine. It's just hard to keep track of. Fourth edition was supposed to come out with a bunch of digital tools, which got canceled due to you know various reasons. Some of them quite tragic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just. I think it was doomed to failure from the beginning. Oh, it was, and I and I think first of all, I appreciate the balls it took to try and do fourth edition. Yeah, I. I think it's unfortunate that you did it the way you did for the reasons that you did it, because it was very much at least my recollection of it is holy shit we're losing a lot of players to pathfinder and yeah. world of warcraft's really popular so let's make D and mmo it it kind of feels mmo and there's and some it arguments felt like world game. of war hey did, if it was not called dungeons and dragons and it was just its own new system breaking in. Like, I think it probably would have, it wouldn't have found mass appeal, but it would have found people that's like, hey, this is good because it's not Dungeons and Dragons. It's an excellent, this is a thing, is that 4th edition was an excellent light war game. Yeah. Like tabletop, you know, build environments and and maps and stuff and bring minis out. And and that's the other thing, like, you know, I know you said you've done fourth edition theater of the mind. I have no idea how you, you pulled it off, man. Dude. Like, unless you decide to just ignore all of the, the, the mechanics that are tied to like proximity and range and distance and all of that shit. There's a few of those that just got ignored. Yeah. But I had spreadsheets. I literally had spreadsheets about who was engaged with who, um, where people were moving. And we did actually bring out minis and and little bits of maps. Mm -hmm. And I had colored rings and various things and we'd make notes because there's like we used a um like a flip chart kind of deal mm-hmm. right and you draw the map and you put your minis on it and then i mean we didn't couldn't afford minis i mean shit there was there was more month than there was money um but you know you'd put out a d4 and it's like this d4 is me and it's like oh i'm gonna be the salt, salt shaker today and then we had like the monopoly pieces out there and all kinds of stuff uh this was before uh all of the the uh, paper minis that you could fold up and, and use or at least I didn't know about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like there was all, just lots of stuff that just went, yeah, we're, we're not like this. And that was five turns ago that we didn't add that plus two that might have made a difference. Who cares? You won anyway. Let's move on. Yeah. Uh, the other thing <sighs> I'll say about fourth edition is that, and uh, let me be clear, fifth edition is not great at this either. Okay. But it's better. Fourth edition had a very clear thing that they were trying to do, and that is heroic fantasy. Your mighty heroes, your mighty villains, you're on an epic quest with all of the shit that's associated with that. You got 30 levels of power curve. You're just you're 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 OP magic beasts. Yes. And as long as you were doing that. And you wanted to 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 bring that out in lots and lots of slow combat, then fourth edition was great, you know. Fifth edition again, while not doing this well, you can certainly run your your heroic epic fantasy. There's enough there to do uh like lower scale kind of grittier stuff within the system as well. Um I just I couldn't see fourth edition working for for any of that. Now it's hard for for you know fifth edition to to kind of try and be more than one thing at a time, but at least there's there's some wiggle room there that I just felt the fourth edition lacked. Yeah, like the yeah. The, the, the more two e style kind of lower fantasy stuff that was common with yeah. second edition. You know, you can you can pull that off with fifth edition. I don't think you can with with fourth. No, fourth, you start off at like fifth or sixth level, it feels like. Yeah. 
Like you already have magical everything when you first start. Um, one of the, uh, the things when fifth edition first came out and I was reading through it, I'm like, the impression that I get is that they wanted to go back to the slightly janky stuff of second edition without the uh the massive spread because in second edition like you get up to like level 10 or 11 and your wizard is basically a god now and your fighter is i mean he's a better fighter but he's still just a fighter nothing really changes right whereas in fifth edition there's a curve there and the the sort of magic user you know mages and wizards and whatever clerics even take off on a steeper curve but the yeah. gap isn't as big as it used to be no and i know for people that have been playing these games a long time, they hate the idea that their game is is friendly to casuals or new players. Yeah, but they shouldn't be. It's wrong. Absolutely, it's wrong. Um, fifth edition lends itself well. And hey, you can always start it. You know, start a campaign at level five. If you want to sure. jump right into, you know, hey, now things are not complex, but there's some meat there for you to sink your teeth into. You can still do that, but you know, the, the, and, and this Pathfinder ran into this more. And I think Pathfinder second edition, I haven't played a lot, but I've read about it and I've, I've watched a lot of videos about it. Um, the, the disparity in challenge between, you know, one level and the next fighting, you know, what would be the equivalent of a, like a CR, whatever, kind of thing like it's just you know this thing's murdering you and now it's easy that's yeah geometric um progression is a thing that people seem to want right like you it's you want that curve to keep curving and it's actually much much more fun if it's a very very shallow slope yeah where you go up a level everything's a little bit easier nothing is easy yeah, and there's progression and there's there's this power curve with 5th edition, but honestly, so much of it is just we're getting more tools in the tool belt. And that's perfect. You know, like I, I, with 4th edition, it was like, okay, well, by level 4, you're expected to all have plus 1 weapons, and by level 7, you're going to have plus 2 this. And, and, you know, it's just scale, 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 all kind of building on top of it. And it's just... just it it found a balance in its own way in much the same way an MMO would, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, they balance the characters against each other, but the unfortunate thing about all the characters being balanced really well... The homogenization of everything. Like it, yeah, it, they all felt really samey. World of Warcraft fell into that, especially in, like, Wrath of the Lich King onward, where it's like, you now every character has their their stun or their interrupt or their, their crowd control a little bit or whatever, you know, for the sake of, of balance... And it just led to sameness, like you said, a bunch of yeah. bunch of classes and specs just being different cosplay on top of the same sort of base mechanics. Yeah, I mean that's that's true of of any game when when you try and actually balance it. Like it, it's difficult to find something like you know like rock paper scissors, right? Is really what you're you're trying to do. Starcraft did it pretty well, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Yeah, and, and I think fifth don't... edition, fifth edition does a better job, I think, of both allowing for specific roles to still have meaning, but not making yes. them required. You know, yes. you can have a cleric that isn't a healer, and yes. you can you can do fine if you have somebody that wants to play that utility healer character. There's a place for them. You can um, have a monk that just punches you back to health. Right. <laughs> Ah, uh, all right. I think uh, unless you have anything else you want to say about fourth edition, that's that's uh, my rant. That was actually more than I expected to ring out of that. So that's pretty good. All right. Uh, we're a little bit lean on pod bag questions. So I think I'm given the time of this episode going to save this question for next episode. And we will get right into parting gifts. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Anybody want a peanut? The floor is yours. Well, I finally found something new, I think, to give as a parting gift. And it's something that I have enjoyed since our days at the call center, which is like 23 years ago now. 
Um, so this is this is a web comic that has been going on for 23 years or a little bit more. Uh, art style has improved a whole bunch. Uh, he is now doing it, has been doing it for 20 years at this point as a full-time job. It updates every day. Um, I find myself, I, I literally went back to, uh, it's on comic 5,500 and something now or something like that. Uh, and I, I went back to about 2,000, like number 2,000. I read through them all again and I found myself, even though I know exactly what's coming, I've read them all before multiple times. I found myself laughing out loud alone in my office, staring at my computer. So the webcomic I'm talking about is questionable content. Uh, it's drawn by a guy named Jeff Jacques. Um, there's references in there to Canada, and they're mostly not wrong. Um, some of them are very tongue-in-cheek uh, and very sarcastic, and I appreciate that a great deal. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. Questionable content. Great This webcomic. may surprise you, especially considering I was in the environment that you were in when you were into it. I've never, ever, ever read of it. Honestly, I don't think I've even heard of it until Oh, my God, today. dude, you, ha you have to go and check it out. It's it's yeah. got robots and sex. It's great. <laughs> what else do you need? I mean, those are the two things that I want from life. <laughs> <laughs> Questionable content, the web comic. All right, I'm definitely going to check it out. Uh, the uh, the picture that I sent you with the joke uh, in Discord yesterday, day before. Mm. That's that's from Questionable Content. Yeah, I ignored it. No, you didn't. You responded to it. Did I? You did. Oh. I have you no recollection. Honestly, man, like the past week has been just insane. It's been so packed. Like I've just been busy, busy at work. And yet I haven't done anything all week. Uh, my Tuesday night game was postponed. Um, I've, I spent two nights just watching movies uh, with Tanya oh. after work. Just, you know, shut my you brain Did you watch up. Aliens? I did not. I will, like a, a whole I episode. will watch it. Well, hey, it still can be. You know what? They're, they're old movies and they're still going to be there for us. What? Um, I, I tried to watch it. We actually tried to watch. I was watching Alien as like first. We were going to watch them in order. Uh, yeah. Tanya and I got into it and I have this set up. So I have legally obtained rips of movies that I store in digital archives in case my media you know, dies or something. Fair. Yeah. And I'm using, uh, most people have probably run in or used Plex. Um, I'm using something that functions similarly called Servio. And uh, it just makes it easy for me to uh, get all of my content off of my computer or up onto like my TVs or handheld devices or whatever. And if necessary, it'll transcode on the fly as it's doing it. And for some reason, when I archived my copies of Alien and Alien 2, am I, am I overselling this? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the copies of, of, of these movies that I had were fine listening to them in just like VLC on my computer, but the audio gain was so low uh, whether it was just part of the transcoding process, trying to watch it on the TV, I had my volume at 100 and I still couldn't hear shit. And I know it's like alien, especially like it's a really quiet opening. It's got that sort of nice scene where you're just, you're in this empty ship before people are starting to wake up. And, but as people started to wake up, I'm like, man, this is quieter than I remember. And then they started talking and it's like, no, I just can't hear shit. Like, you know, so I, I need to, to in, figure it's in that five. It, it's in five point one. You don't have the center channel. Maybe I'm transcoding it down to stereo, but it's it's missing something in that. So I gotta gonna figure that out, or I'll just I'll watch it downstairs right on my machine. Anyway, hey, that's our episode. Um, if you, uh, I'm gonna plug the emails. I'm gonna plug the YouTube channel. I don't know how you're listening professional podcast people do this and and we suck at it i suck at it in particular but if you're listening I, to this show i appreciate that you found us somewhere uh wherever you found us we exist in other places too we have a youtube channel nerding under the influence uh you can find podcast audio form if you happen to be watching this on youtube uh basically everywhere 
uh, everywhere podcasts are found. Just give us a search. Nerding Under the Influence, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher died, so not there. Um, Spotify. Hey, we're everywhere. We're cropping up on aggregators that like I didn't know existed, and I certainly didn't submit our shit to there. They're just scraping somebody, but hey. Awesome. Wherever you found us, check us out. Maybe leave us a rating if you've liked what you've heard. I mean, this episode's a little bit dry, but maybe you found another episode worth giving us a, a rating of some right. positive variety. Uh, give us a shout on YouTube. Leave a comment. Leave a like. If you have any ideas, questions you'd like to submit for parting gifts to our pod bag, pod bag at nerdingundertheinfluence.com. We'd love to hear from you. There was was that great? Did I, say? I mean, the, smash the like button and all of that shit. Yeah, I think I think we need to do like an O face and jump up and down or something or flash our boobs. I don't know. You say you suck at it, but I don't even try. So I think that you're like a hundred percent better than I am. Well, I like I've tried two episodes. Uh, was this episode nineteen now? So tries doing some some heavy lifting there. I mean, it's five percent, ten percent. You're good. All right. I've decided that this blue lobster vodka soda lime thing kind of sucks. So uh, let's end this episode here. I'm going to go grab another drink and why don't we record another one? All right, let's do it. We'll coordinate for shirts on the second one too.